Today I want to talk to you about tilings or tessellations. Uh, now these are as much works of art as they are studies in mathematics or geometry and they go back thousands of years to 3000 BC or earlier and you find them on the walls, the floors, the ceilings of buildings uh, from civilizations such as ancient Sumeria and Babylon. The thing about a tiling is it's made from pieces that fit together perfectly without any gaps or overlaps and that can be repeated endlessly. Now as I say they are used as works of art and I want to talk a little bit about the history of tilings and one artist in particular who used uh, tilings and tessellations in his artwork. But mainly I want to focus on the mathematics. So let's discover the maths of tilings. The words tiling and tessellation are used interchangeably. Tessellation comes from the Latin tessellatus, meaning of small square stones or tiles, but is used today to describe a perfectly fitting pattern made of any shaped tiles. In many tessellations, the tiles consist of regular polygons, straight-sided shapes in which all the angles are equal and all the sides are the same length. A regular tiling is made from just one kind of regular polygon. It turns out that there are only three types possible, those formed from equilateral triangles, squares or regular hexagons. The reason these three and only these three work is that their interior angles, 60 degrees, 90 degrees and 120 degrees respectively, all divide into 360 degrees exactly, which is the angle that tiles must make where their vertices or corners meet. A semi-regular tiling is also built up from regular polygons, but of more than one variety, and in such a way that the arrangement of polygons at every vertex is identical. There are eight of these in all, or nine if you include the tilings of equilateral triangles and hexagons that are mirror images of each other. Among the other semi-regular tilings are two that involve squares and triangles, and one made from dodecagons, that's 12-sided shapes, squares and hexagons. Irregular tilings include every other possibility. In other words, they can be made from tiles of any shape, not just regular polygons, or even shapes that have straight sides. In nature, the most familiar example of a tessellation is the honeycomb, with its array of neatly stacked hexagons. Larger hexagonal tessellations seen in formations of columnar basalt, where in the past lava has slowly cooled, occur in many places around the world, including the Giant's Causeway in Ireland and the Devil's Postpile in California. Tessellated patterns are found on certain flowers, such as the fritillary, and in the scales of fish and snakes. The known history of human-made tessellations begins around 3000 BC, or perhaps a little earlier, with some mosaics on the columns of a Sumerian building in what is now southern Iraq. Small hexagonal tiles of different colours have been arranged to make zigzag and diamond-shaped patterns. Because the tiles are regular hexagons fitted closely together, they do make genuine tessellations. This isn't the case with most mosaics, such as those often found in Roman villas, which depict scenes involving people or animals. The pieces in many mosaics, although closely spaced, have gaps between them, and so fail the mathematical definition of a tiling. In the Islamic world, the representation of living things or real objects of any kind is forbidden, as it's interpreted as a kind of idolatry. Decorations in buildings were therefore restricted to purely geometrical forms. Islamic artists made the most of the limited scope in which they had to work by devising intricate and ornate patterns of shapes that locked together perfectly. Nowhere is this ingenuity better illustrated than in the fabulous Palace of Alhambra in southern Spain. Originally constructed as a small fortress in 889 AD, it was rebuilt and expanded and finally, in the 14th century, converted to a magnificent palace of royal residence. On the walls of the Alhambra is a tour de force of the art of tiling, breathtaking in its variety and skill. 
The tile patterns at the Alhambra include arrangements not just of polygons, but also of curve shapes and tiles of different colours, put together in a celebration of both technical and aesthetic artistry. Related to the concept of tilings is that of something called wallpaper groups, of which there are 17. A wallpaper group is a mathematical way of classifying a two-dimensional repetitive pattern on the basis of the symmetries that the pattern displays. There are just four basic symmetry operations in two dimensions, reflection, rotation, translation and glide symmetry. Every wallpaper group contains two distinct translations, so that any tiling that belongs to it can repeat endlessly and periodically to cover the entire plane. In addition, it may have other types of symmetry including a centre of rotation, an axis of reflection and an axis of glide reflection. It's been widely claimed that the many different tilings found at the Alhambra include representatives from all 17 wallpaper groups, although some mathematicians dispute this and say that a few of the groups may be missing. Nevertheless, the variety of tilings on display is mightily impressive. Certainly, it impressed and entranced the Dutch artist Moritz Escher, who first visited the Moorish Palace as a young man in 1922, before returning for a lengthier stay in 1936. He spent days sketching the tilings and taking notes, until he became completely obsessed with the idea of tessellations. Afterwards he wrote, It remains an extremely absorbing activity, a real mania to which I have become addicted, and from which I sometimes find it hard to tear myself away. The sketches that Escher made at the Alhambra became a major source of inspiration for his subsequent artwork. He delved into the maths behind what he called the regular division of the plane by reading papers by the Hungarian George Polya and the German crystallographer Friedrich Haag on plane symmetry. These papers were sent to him by his brother Berend, who was a geologist and keenly aware of the importance of symmetry in crystal structures. Escher familiarised himself with these 17 wallpaper groups and started to create periodic tilings of his own using geometric grids. In place of polygonal elements, however, he experimented with complex interlocking shapes in the forms of birds, fish, reptiles and a particularly ingenious combination of angels and devils. One of his earliest works based on tessellation and a hexagonal grid was Study of Regular Division of the Plane with Reptiles, 1939, rendered in pencil, ink and watercolour. The heads of three lizards, green, red and white, meet at each vertex, while the rest of their bodies fit together precisely, leaving no gaps. It was a design that he used again in his famous lithograph, Reptiles, four years later. The mathematical exploration of tilings as distinct from their purely artistic expression began only a few centuries ago. One of the first to take up the challenge was German astronomer and mathematician Johann Kepler, who wrote about tessellations in his great work Harmonices Mundi, Harmony of the Worlds, published in 1619. In the first two chapters of this he tackled regular and semi-regular polygons, which led him to consider how regular and semi-regular tilings can fill the plane. It might seem surprising that Kepler, best known for his three laws of planetary motion, and who in Harmonices Mundi was mainly concerned with what he perceived as links between music theory and the movements of worlds, should include a discussion of tilings. But this was a time when mysticism and science were still entwined, and in Kepler's mind, the perfection of the heavens must be reflected in the perfection of certain geometric forms and consonant notes on the musical scale. He was the first to investigate the mathematical structure of honeycombs and snowflakes, and the first to identify the eight forms of semi-regular tiling, in addition to the three regular tilings. The former he referred to as perfect congruences, and the latter as most perfect congruences. Sadly, his work on tilings was largely ignored by generations of mathematicians who followed, 
and was overshadowed to a large extent by his famous astronomical work. It wasn't until the late 19th century that any significant further developments in the subject took place. When they did, it was in response to an urgent scientific problem, the need to clarify all the various forms that crystals could take. In fact, the next great leap in the maths of tilings was made by Russian Evgrav Fedorov, who combined deep interests in crystallography and geometry. Early on, he was intrigued by polytopes, objects with flat sides that may exist in any number of dimensions. In 1891, six years after he published a book on this subject, Basics of Polytopes, he proved the two results for which he is best known. First, he showed that there are exactly 230 space groups. These are all the possible symmetry groups of objects in three dimensions, and represent the unique ways in terms of their symmetry properties that, for instance, atoms can be arranged to form crystals. On the back of this discovery, he was able to show that in two dimensions, the 230 space groups reduce to just 17 types, the wallpaper groups which we mentioned earlier. All the kinds of tilings we've talked about so far have been periodic. What this means, in a nutshell, is that the pattern of the tiling repeats in two independent directions. In the next video, we'll enter the strange world of aperiodic tilings. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.